This is the Tom Anderson Show, broadcasting live from the KVNT studios, 7 to 9 a.m., Monday through Friday. Well, we are back, and it's always a pleasure to hear from authors who cover areas of our history in America that you may not have known about, and you can learn something. You can teach your kids and grandkids, and maybe we can do a better job. When I look at presidents, and I've read enough, I'm a history buff somewhat, and never written a book on such, but you often hear, and and I, I get frustrated that James Buchanan had always picked as the worst president. I wouldn't agree with that, but that Andrew Johnson, to me, would be the biggie, and some say Franklin Pierce, but oddly, Warren G. Harding is tossed in the mix. And his vice president was Calvin Coolidge. And I know Regnery has an author coming forth here with a, a Coolidge uh, book. But we also have uh, the fact that Hardin, I don't think, should be on that list. And a gentleman that's written about him, and actually it's eloquent, it's thoughtful, it's well-researched. And I think that uh, he would say he's been unfairly maligned. Ryan Walters joins us. The book is The Jazz Age President Defending Warren G. Harding. And Ryan, welcome to the program. I know you're in the great state of Texas. I led with that, you know, worst presidents, and I know that's subjective, but is that one of the reasons why you wrote the book to kind of clear him of that bad rap and adding him to that list where you probably think, and I agree with you, it's not fair? Absolutely. That's one of the main reasons. When you really dig into Harding's record, Look at his real record. Look at what he really did. Don't, don't look at what some historians have said he did or said he said or, or put their spin on it. Look at what he actually did. Go to the primary sources. Look at the record. There's no reason for him to be maligned in that way. His reputation shouldn't be tarnished that way. And the reason I call him the most maligned president, because if you look at the presidential rankings, going back to the very first one in 1948, Harding has finished last in more of them than anybody else. Now, he, as you mentioned, James Buchanan, they're kind of neck and neck right now. Uh, Harding has actually come up a few spots in recent years, but he's still in the bottom ten. That's considered a failed presidency. When you look at his record of accomplishments, um, I don't see how that's possible, except that most historians, most scholars, most history departments across the country are dominated by left-wing academics. They, sure. they admire Woodrow Wilson and FDR. So they're not going to like Harding. And so they're going to place him you know, down the, lot, down the list at the bottom. And they're going to rank their people up, up near the top. So it just really depends on your worldview, your political philosophy, uh, how you see the world. When you write a book about a president, and there are obviously, for all of our presidents, enough books out there and articles and research, and now we can even go to Wikipedia and grab information that way and through that method online. How does someone, how did you do the research to overview this? Because I'm sure there's a lot of lot of assets and things you can look at, but did you say, no, I'm going to dig deeper, or is there a way to dig deeper? I assume public information information is there and now most books with presidents of his time frame you you kind of just put your spin on it or did you find something new that maybe none of us have read in other harding uh, you know books and biographies and autobiographies and such well as a historian uh, the first thing you, you should should do is look at the primary sources that's the first hand accounts uh, whoever your subject is, their letters, speeches, <clears throat> uh, papers, things of that nature. And then you look at memoirs of people that knew them, that, that covered them at their reporter, or people that served with them. Um, you don't start with secondary sources, which are you know something that a historian wrote okay. about that particular subject. Start with the primary sources. One of the, one of the things that's unfair about Harding is he was trashed for a number of years. His papers weren't released to the public until 1964. So a lot of things that were written, particularly after he died in 1923, um, didn't have his letters. And fortunately for me, um, a couple of historians went through his letters and published a volume of them. And that's the first thing I did. I bought that book, very expensive book, but I bought it, started reading his letters, and I thought, this guy, is one of the myths is he's not intellectual, he's dumb, um, not, the, not the you know sharpest knife in the drawer, 
But when you read his letters, you don't see that at all. You see somebody that did have a grasp of the issues, that did know what was going on, um, did understand how the game of politics uh, worked. And again, there's very few uh, scholars that have taken this task on. Probably one of the only real full books that we have on Harding that treated him fairly was John Dean's little volume in 2004. But I said, you know, I want to dig deeper. I want to find as many sources as I can. And I found a lot of primary sources, people that worked in the White House. One of the myths is he had all these wild parties and women and, and he was a womanizer, that kind of thing. I found the memoirs of three people that worked in the White House. All three of them said none of that stuff happened. No women came in there, and one of them was a Secret Service agent. Wow. But nobody, nobody came in the White House to see him. So you, you can find the sources if you dig, and it's a lot easier. As you mentioned, the Internet makes it so much easier. Of course, I'm old enough to remember the old card catalog. You, know, you have to go to the library that, and man. pull out the cards. And, oh, and now brother, with the internet, me there's, too. There's things that are on there. Me too. And, you know, you go like I'm looking at usnews.com, and I don't normally go there for my radio show or for my news. I mean, I bet you people listening, we have a conservative audience. They don't go to usnews.com for their news, but but someone's written that, written that about Harding. Hey, the dude had a mistress and uh, smoke-filled rooms and this and that and was letting people, you know, do this or letting them do that. And it leads where they, they basically bash him where they say, hey, this is a guy who actually said, quote, I'm not fit for this office and should never have been here. And I don't know when he said that quote or if it's accurate, but I think that people can be misquoted. You just brought up the fact that you looked at other sources and, you know, someone's picking on him because he golfed or or suggesting that he had an affair and they're not looking at uh, you know, the details of what he did like you would do. So, no, I, I like that fact, and I'm glad that you explained to us as an author what you did. And I love this, the, the notion and the delineation of second versus first versus, you know, tertiary uh, sources and how that works. Well, how he reversed America's interventionist foreign policy, and I assume that means where we, you know, butt into other countries, um, uh, you know, markets or uh, warring issues or uh, what, if not economy, then certainly their cultural issues. And then he championed in America first approach. L let's talk about that first. So was he a foreign affairs president? No, not, not first and foremost. Um, the country was in bad shape. And that's really one, things I, one of the things I do in the book early on is I sort of set the stage. You really have to understand how bad the shape the country was in when Harding came into office, uh, that 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 puts him in the proper context. Some historians have even denied that and said, "Well, he wasn't a good president because he didn't really accomplish anything because nothing was going on in the country." The country was in bad shape coming out of World War One that ended in November 1918. They had a terrible food pandemic swept around the globe. Uh, uh, 1919 was a terrible year. I have a chapter on that. We had terroristic bombings around the country. There was labor strikes. There was racial violence in the summer of 1919. that was so bad they nicknamed it the Red Summer. Uh, the, the economy went into a depression in January of 1920. Uh, unemployment went up to 12%. I mean, the industrial production fell 95%. The country was in bad shape when he came into office, and he ran under the slogan, most people know this, return to normalcy. And that's what people wanted to hear. It was a perfect slogan, and that's what he wanted to do. He said it's time to reverse all this. No more crusades in Europe uh, on behalf of some uh, other nations. You know, we've got to reverse uh, the, the problems in the economy. And he got over 60% of the vote in 1920. Man, that's a, I mean, and, and the, the timing right after, like you say, you're talking about the holidays of 1918, right after, now, now World War One's over, and, and that starts, I mean, I'm sure there was a domino effect, it wasn't instant, but it was a, a percolating mm -hmm. uh, economic disaster, and now we get into the early 20s, and he's there, and, and the your title the jazz age president i mean obviously there's a there's somewhat of a transition here how soon after he gets in do things change well the depression and that was probably the worst thing and he tackled that first he said you know we don't we don't fix the economy the rest of it doesn't matter um he had problems in foreign policy to straighten out and a lot of that was just simply to go back as you mentioned to america first foreign policy where we're, he said we're not getting entangled anymore in the in the problems of the old world meaning europe 
So we got to tackle the economy, and they, they massively cut spending, massively cut uh, taxes and, 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 and government, and, and use what our founding fathers called retrenchment. And retrenchment. And Hold that thought, Ryan, because that's a perfect okay. segue. We're going to come right back. We're going to go to a break. We're going to come back with Ryan S. Walters. He's the author of The Jazz Age President, Defending Warren G. Harding. Now we're going to get into the fun stuff like the Roaring Twenties. Stay with us. Tom Anderson Show. This is the Tom Anderson Show, broadcasting live from the KVNT studios, 7 to 9 a.m., Monday through Friday. The Jazz Age president defending Warren G. Harding, Ryan S. Walters, joins us. You can purchase it at Regnery. They're going to bounce you over to Amazon, so probably the easiest way is to go to Amazon. Uh, February 15th, this week, my friends, this book was released, and we were on a thought, Ryan, you can continue, and I want to get into Warren G. Harding in Alaska, and you were on a cruise. We were talking on the break, and you checked out areas that he was at, and people have heard of the Warren, uh, or the, the Harding, I was going to say Warren Harding Ice Field, it's Harding Ice Field, and then what happened, why President Harding did not finish his full term. So after June 1923, when he came up here, you have, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. But why don't you finish right. your point on when we were talking about economy in the Roaring Twenties, right. and then we'll get into his travels. Well, he instituted, as I mentioned, as we went to the break, retrenchment. That's what the founding fathers' generation called it. And and from really the early years up until FDR, uh, the government handled depressions differently they didn't they don't stimulate the economy they don't do all these things they retrench which is to cut taxes and cut government and let the economy uh come back on its own and that's one a lot of those depressions were short-lived and that's what he did um the top rate on taxes uh under woodrow wilson was more than 70 percent uh spending went from 700 million dollars before world war one to almost 20 billion dollars uh, Harding and Coolidge cut that down to about three billion. Cut taxes massively, reduced regulations, uh, raised tariffs to keep European uh, nations from dumping their goods into our market. Um, foreign policy. They also instituted the same policies. They went back to America first foreign policy. Harding formally ended World War One. He withdrew our remaining troops from Germany. Withdrew troops from Latin America. Woodrow Wilson had poisoned relations with Mexico and Latin America. And he restored those relations, withdrew troops from the Caribbean. Uh, he called the Washington Disarmament Conference to begin uh, not full disarmament, but to scale back uh, navies. Navies were the big weapons of the day. That was the feared weapons. This is before air power had fully developed, certainly before nuclear weapons. So they called that conference. It was the first one that the United States had ever been involved in. It was in Washington, and nations came, and they scaled back their navies. Uh, banned poison gas. There were treaties struck at that um, conference that eased tensions in the Pacific with Japan and, and averted war for a decade, according to one scholar. Uh, Harding, here's a little tidbit for you, he was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize on the basis of his foreign policy. And so his foreign policy record doesn't hardly get any positive coverage, but it was actually very good. And when I look at his background, I want to get into the Alaska part of this and his travels, but let's backtrack a bit. I mean, I didn't want to get into the whole, because I want people to read your book. You know, the the day Warren Harding was born, tell me about his parents. Did he have siblings? What was his favorite hobby? Well, we could do that. And I'm, the, the, whether you cover that or not, there are books about that. Rather than ask that, because... You know, news talk shows, this one's no different. We get into politics. Right now it's Biden or it's Trump. But back in the day, what, real quick, what was his background? How did he get to the presidency? He was born in Ohio. He was raised in Marion, Ohio, uh, born on November the 2nd, 1865, a few months after the Civil War ended. Uh, he started out his career as a journalist and, and bought a newspaper in Marion, the Marion Star, which is still in existence. Uh, he and a few friends for a few hundred dollars, but he, in, he ended up buying them out. And that's what he did. He was a journalist, a newspaper owner. Uh, of course, that led into politics. He served a couple of terms in the state Senate in Ohio, Ohio's lieutenant governor. 
1910, he lost a bid for the governorship, but he bounced back in 1914 and won a U.S. Senate seat, and that's where he was when he was given the nomination in 1920. So he was not a complete novice. He had some he had some experience in government. Yeah, no, that sounds like, and then you know McKinley, and and there's the the. The, um, the the namesake here, eponymous for a lot of things, of course, our biggest mountain now renamed uh, under uh, Obama to Denali, much to my chagrin. I wrote an article in The Hill about that, trying to keep it uh, Mount McKinley. But there's a lot of folks that listen to my show that dis- differ with me. So be it. But he was, McKinley was, a, was a, of course, a U.S. Senator from Ohio, and there were some others. I think Taft was from Cincinnati. But so, so he's an Ohio boy. So now president, so now deciding, he's not in long. I mean, he's in a, a presidential terms four years. But by 2023 summer, he decides to go to Alaska. And, and such a nexus for our listeners, if they didn't know that Harding came here, now you do real quick tell me about that trip why he did it and what happened from it we know the negative of it as well right he he, he began it in the summer of 1923 as a uh, uh, train trip across the country called a voyage of understanding um, harding was a you know a small town guy he was a humble guy he was very kind and generous he liked to be around regular people he liked people you know out talking to him that's what he wanted to do and he was the first president to ever visit Alaska. He drove in a ceremonial final spike to complete the Alaskan Railroad while he was up there and went to Skagway. As you mentioned, I, I went to Skagway a number of years ago, and there's a there's a glacier there called the Harding Glacier that they named after him. And he came back down the West Coast, um, got to Seattle, and became ill. He was given a speech and got through the speech, had a little trouble getting through it. Uh, they the doctors there said, well, you probably had some bad seafood or something, probably a stomach ailment. Uh, so they canceled his speeches in Portland. He was going down the West Coast uh, giving speeches, and so they took him to San Francisco. They brought in a heart specialist, and he said, no, this is not a stomach ailment. You had a mild heart attack. So they put him in a hotel room there in San Francisco and so he could rest and recuperate. And on August the 2nd, 1923, his wife Florence was reading to him, and he had a sudden stroke and he died uh, right there in the hotel oh boy yeah that's a it, and you know folks he, he, you've got mount harding that he's talking about uh near skagway you've got the harding ice field uh, kenai mountains if you've ever been to the kenai fjords and taken a tour you can see the ice field there and yeah, that's a. It, it's sad to think that that coming up here, and it, obviously not because of Alaska, but more so because of physiology and his issues. He came back and he couldn't couldn't finish his presidency. But I encourage people to purchase the Jazz Age President I Am, and and read this defending Warren G. Harding by our guest Ryan Walters. So in wrap up, we got a couple minutes left. What, what would you leave, folks? Most of us have. I'm someone that digs books like yours, and so that's why I wanted you on my show. And I think you're going to sell books, and I think people will will find interest in it. But I hope they learn from it, and maybe give me a point or two or three that. You you learn and that you want people to get from this without sealing the thunder of the content about Harding? Well, again, you have to really look at his record and realize that American history is full of myths and lies and falsehoods. And you have to learn how to get recognize that and get around it and see who's saying what and why they're saying it. And you do that by looking at the actual record. And when you look at his accomplishments, and I have them, throughout the book, and you can sit and look at him, you really say, wow, this guy accomplished a lot in only 881 days in office. Uh, he served less time than John F. Kennedy, and his accomplishments are more impressive than John F. Kennedy. So if you're an America first guy, you're a MAGA person, you like Trump, you like conservatism, you'll like Warren Harding. If you don't, you probably won't. Yeah, that's fair. My favorite president's Teddy Roosevelt, and I have a few that I really dig, but but I enjoy what he did in his personality and his style. Didn't I didn't agree with everything he did, but but Harding, I have talked with friends and scholars, and so often that's the narrative. They say he got a bum rap, 
and if he was in longer, he would have got the the coverage that Calvin Coolidge did, as your book entitled suggests, the Jazz Age and and uh, the presidency that that Warring Harding served in. Well, I appreciate the fact that you took the time to write this. Two other questions: How long did it take you to write? And are you going to do a book tour? Well, I, I spent an entire year on it. I think I signed the contract in in February, um, and I, I was through by December. So I spent an entire year uh, writing it. Um, and, of course, hadn't heard much on a book tour. We just put it out there. I've done a lot of interviews. I was on C-SPAN the other day. So hopefully we will. Hopefully we'll get some book signings, and uh, maybe I'll come back to Alaska. I need to oh, I would love it. We'll, we'll get you in here. <laughs> My friend Ryan Walters, I dig this guy, and I mean that sincerely. You're an easy, fun interview. You're an intellect, but you dumb it down for all of us. The Jazz Age president defending Warren G. Harding. I'm going to get the book. I hope you do, too. You can get it at Regnery and Amazon. Thank you, Ryan, for your time. I thank you. Appreciate it so much. You betcha. I recommend the book, folks. Stay with us. Tom Anderson Show.